Uh, just uh, before uh, I take questions, um, I want to say how pleased I am to be joined by uh, my colleague and my friend, Mr. Mike Farnworth, who is the uh, British Columbia Minister for Public Safety. Um, he and I had uh, an excellent conversation uh, right now, really an ongoing exercise, and I want to thank uh, you, uh, uh, Mike, and uh, the entire British Columbia government for the support and the collaboration with the federal government on a number of priorities. Uh, most uh, recently, the launch of Bill C-21, uh, our firearms legislation, which would, among other things, uh, implement a, a national handgun freeze, uh, take on organized crime, and reverse the alarming trends uh, that we've seen uh, with domestic violence in connection uh, with guns. Uh, and so with that, uh, I would also just say before I turn over to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Minister Farnworth that uh, earlier today uh, I was pleased to see some of our colleagues uh, at the Standing Committee for Public Safety introduce a motion which would accelerate the implementation of a national handgun freeze. Uh, unfortunately, the Conservatives yet again blocked that motion, um, but at least it's on the, uh, on the table for committee business to, to begin debating again unless we see more filibustering. But again, it just really underlines the need to uh, debate this bill, to study this bill, and to pass this bill as quickly as possible. And again, I'll turn it over to uh, Minister Farmworth for some comments. Thank you. No, uh, thank you, uh, Marco. And it, uh, it, it really is a, a pleasure to be here in, uh, in Ottawa uh, to have meetings uh, with, uh, with Marco uh, and the, uh, the federal government. Um, today, we were talking about issues of concern of public safety. As you may know, that's been a significant issue in British Columbia. And so we've been very pleased with uh, Bill C-21. We think it's been uh, very positively received uh, by the public. Uh, and it will have additional measures that are going to assist us uh, in dealing with some of the challenges that we've been facing over the, uh, the last number of years. Uh, at the same time, we are uh, uh, meeting tomorrow with the, uh, the federal, um, provincial, British Columbia uh, table on uh, emergency preparedness and disaster management uh, with Minister Bill Blair uh, to deal with the, uh, the challenges that we have faced in our province over the last, the last uh, couple of years, last year in particular with the, uh, the floods, the fires, the heat dome, uh, and our work with the, uh, the federal government has, uh, has been uh, very positive in that regard. So uh, I'm looking forward uh, to that meeting as well. Et je peux offrir quelques paroles en français, parce que je sais que vous êtes là. Donc, je vous remercie à mon homologue de le BC, le ministre Mike Farnworth, pour son appui, pour son collaboration, particulièrement sur le projet de loi C-21. C'est le nouveau projet de loi pour protéger nos communautés avec quelques importantes priorités. Par exemple, l'introduction d'un gel national pour les hommes de poing. Le projet de loi même a ciblé les, les criminels organisés avec des sanctions pénales qui sont plus sévères. Et aussi, le projet de loi renverser la tendance très négative à, avec à, à, les violences conjugales avec, à, avec à, les armes de, de feu, armes à feu, pardon. Et c'est une bonne collaboration, mais à, ces projets de loi vont à, mieux protéger nos communautés. Uh, well, I, I'm prepared to work 24-7 uh, on this bill to see it uh, passed as quickly as possible, but notwithstanding what you may be hearing, um, all the Conservatives are doing right now is filibustering and delaying. And that is extremely concerning to me because um, we need to uh, pass this bill as quickly as possible. As I said, there are some very effective tools within it, including the national handgun freeze, uh, some of the measures that we're uh, going to be implementing to take on organized crime, especially um, illegal smuggling at the border. And I had the chance to go and visit uh, the Pack Highway in British Columbia, where I saw frontline officers using uh, technology, uh, providing them some additional authorities, uh, as well as um, the uh, measures around red flag laws, which will reverse. Uh, the trends around um, domestic violence in connection with guns. So uh, conservatives are saying, I think, are talking out of both sides of their mouth. Uh, what they really should be doing is allowing for the debate uh, to move forward as quickly as possible so that we can pass the bill. I don't know, Mike, if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, uh, we view this uh, legislation as, uh, as important. Uh, it has uh, a lot of measures in it that uh, will be of significance uh, to British Columbia uh, in dealing with our uh, battles with uh, organized crime uh, and with uh, gun and gang violence. So I certainly would uh, hope that uh, it can be passed as, as quickly as possible. Oui. Oui. Pourquoi est-ce que dans ce cas-là, si, euh, si vous voulez agir tout de suite, pourquoi est-ce que vous n'émettez pas un décret pour dire on gèle tout de suite? 
les armes de poing, vous avez le pouvoir comme gouvernement. Mais c'est exactement ce qu'on avait fait avec l'introduction d'une euh, proposition qui modifiait les, les règlements sous les, euh, les lois de les armes à feu. Donc, il faut suivre le, le, les, les ordres de la Chambre, mais on veut accélérer le processus de l'implémentation avec la collaboration avec tous les députés. Et c'est exactement qu a, euh, que, que les députés à, au comité a essayé de faire plutôt aujourd'hui avec une motion, mais le conservateur a bloqué est bloqué aujourd'hui. Euh, le conservateur a bloqué les dernières semaines, le commencement du débat. Donc, le résultat est plus de délai. Donc, si, si, si les conservateurs croient que c'est une un priorité, il faut permettre le débat de commencer. Et si, oui, bien sûr, le, 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 le débat, justement, qui est supposé commencer ce soir, sur ces, ben, fin d'après-midi, soirée, sur euh, la deuxième lecture, euh, même là, même si le débat commence, ce euh, ne sera pas fini, l'étude du projet de loi, là, avant euh, l'automne. Euh... Mais écoute, euh, nous, nous vivons euh, toujours euh, dans l'esprit euh, euh, d'espérance, OK? Euh, on a des, des heures pro prolongées. Euh, moi, je reste ici euh, à minuit, euh, même après, si c'est possible, pour, pour avancer les débats. Pourquoi? Parce que tous les gens, euh, ou la majorité des de gens, les Canadiens et les Canadiennes, appuient ce projet de loi. Pourquoi? On avait écouté, on avait respecté le conseil qu'on a reçu de la force policière, des de organismes des femmes, des de organismes qui représentent les survivants. Il y a un, un, un très grand consensus que c'est une étape significative. Mais les conservateurs, il faut arrêter les délais. Mais en même temps, les conseils, juste pour revenir sur l'histoire du décret, vous n'avez pas besoin de l'appui des conservateurs pour émettre un décret pour, un, pour geler les armes de poing. Vous pouvez y aller sans les conservateurs. Mais il y a, mais, mais il y a des autres ordres qui fonctionnent dans la Chambre avant la le, euh, le période euh, où les règlements euh, deviennent en, en effet. Les 30 jours. Oui, exact. Oui. Et mais, mais justement, euh, là, il reste jusqu'au 23 juin pour le projet de loi. Mais le projet de loi, il va falloir qu'il aille au Sénat aussi. Donc, est-ce que c'est vraiment réaliste d'espérer, de, 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 comme on va vous continuer. dites? On va continuer avec tous les efforts. OK? Ask question in English. Minister, can I just get you on the situation with Pearson Airport? Um, how much do you think the airlines are to blame, and how they're routing flights on the airport? How much do you think the airlines are to blame, and how they're routing flights through Toronto as a hub? Or does it still, the blame still rest on you, the federal government, and the lack of resources? Well, look, as I said yesterday, it, it requires a full core press, not only from government, but the airline industry as well. And we know that um, that means making sure that people are coming back to work, uh, that they're properly staffed. Some of those delays occur on the tarmac as a result of not having uh, flight attendants that are ready at the gates. Um, and once people are off the, the plane, the, there are also delays in the airports themselves. Uh, part of that is uh, with CBSA, part of that is with CATSA, which is why we've been adding more people significantly, particularly at Pearson International, particularly at Vancouver uh, International Airport, which is why we're uh, looking at ways to further streamline uh, some of the, um, the health protocols which remain in place uh, to protect uh, Canadians from the virus. And many of those have been removed, and we're going to continue to exhaust all efforts so that tra uh, traveling can resume uh, expeditiously. Is it on your government's table to bring back unvaccinated workers? I'm sorry, sorry? Is it on the table to bring back those who perhaps were fired because oh, like they the were vaccinated? Around. Yeah. So look, I mean, uh, up until now, uh, we have followed the, will continue to follow the advice of, of public health care experts. The, the vaccine mandates were a very useful tool in allowing us to see up to, I think, roughly 80%, slightly higher than 80% uh, of all Canadians uh, taking up the cause of getting vaccinated. That's one way in which we're getting the economy uh, rolling again. So we'll continue to engage our public health care officials as we uh, navigate the uh, weeks and months ahead. And there's just one more question on C21. What's the importance of having it passed as a whole rather than potentially cut into uh, smaller pieces? What's the benefit of having, you know, as it's written now? I, look, I think that C21 as a package represents and contains a suite of measures uh, that will, again, introduce a national handgun freeze that will take on crime, that will reverse the alarming trends when it comes to intimate partner and domestic violence and guns. And my uh, sincere hope is that the committee, the chamber, and then the Senate will view the package as a whole. Are we open to making improvements and modifications on certain provisions that are within it? Yes, and I have said on a couple of very specific issues, including on the definition of AR-15s and assault-style rifles, uh, that I think we need to be very mindful about maybe um, ensuring that that definition is ensconced in the law and can't just be pulled uh, out from an order in council. So we're, we're prepared uh, to work with all, all deputies on that. I just have one more uh, statement to make. I, 
Um, I want to say uh, the following. Um, you're running to form government. Uh, you're running to form uh, a government uh, that has an important uh, job to do uh, in protecting Canadians, then you better know what it takes to protect Canadians. And um, Pierre Poilev, in the midst of an unprecedented pu uh, public order emergency in this country, egged on the illegal occupation while the Prime Minister, uh, myself, and all of the members of our government, partners in provincial government uh, and law enforcement were working 24-7 uh, to restore public safety. We saw with our own eyes the significant and devastating impacts of the blockades to our economy, to people's safety, and it is absolutely wrong what Pierre Poilev did throughout the, the illegal blockades because by egging them on, his words, his language was weaponized. And language matters. And how many of those individuals stayed on while law enforcement had to do the extraordinarily difficult job of dissipating the illegal occupation here in Ottawa? He, those words put at risk the public safety of the people who live in Ottawa, the people who lived in border communities in Coots, Alberta, at the Pack Highway in British Columbia, in Windsor, Ontario. That was wrong. And I'm, I, I will simply underline the fact that that is probably why Jean Charest said that Pierre Poilev's language was disqualifying uh, in his run for CPC leadership. On this side of the House, we will always place public safety as a paramount objective, and Pierre Poilev can come and debate me on that anytime he wants. He knows exactly where to find me. Thank you. A few questions about uh, welcoming of Ukrainians. Sure, do you mind um, if I ditch this with you? So the, the subscriptions uh, are open for uh, free flight tickets with masks for migrants uh, starting tomorrow. That's right. But it's only 500 uh, tickets per, so how are you going to get to 10,000? Yeah, so one of the things I want to be clear is that the program's being uh, administered by uh, Miles for Migrants uh, as a result of the partnership with Air Canada and the Shapiro Foundation. Uh, I understand they're starting with 500. When you launch a brand new program, and Miles for Migrants has never operated at this scale before, incredible organization, incredible initiative. Uh, my understanding is that they're going to start with 500 to make sure that the system works, but they're going to make good on the full 10,000. They have exceeded the matching contribution that uh, Air Canada and the Shapiro Foundation have made a commitment to, uh, and they now have uh, enough uh, aer aeroplan points in place uh, to support at least uh, 10,000 Ukrainians who are going to be coming to Canada. It's a very exciting initiative. I think it's going to uh, be a very successful outcome. Is it going quick enough for you? Uh, like Because it's starting only with 500, and you know, uh, people are waiting, I've been waiting for months. So. Well, just if I may, I'd point out that there's more than 30,000 Ukrainians who've already landed in Canada. Uh, we have not seen a pace of arrivals like this. Uh, and of course, that's a result of a number of factors, uh, chiefly uh, as a result of the fact that Ukrainians have the ability to safely travel outside of Ukraine westerly and have access to different travel opportunities from Europe for onward travel to Canada. In addition, we had the uh, recent arrivals of three different charters uh, that brought approximately, well, in excess of 900 people to Canada uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, we're now seeing with this extraordinarily generous contribution, more than 10,000 more will arrive. I expect, uh, based on the interests of the people who are uh, seeking to come to Canada, based on the facts on the ground, uh, there's going to be a number of factors that will determine how quickly people come. Uh, but so far, we have not seen major obstacles in terms of the actual ability of people who are seeking to come to Canada uh, to get here, given the widely available uh, commercial options. This initiative is going to make that easier by alleviating the cost burden for at least 10,000 people. Prime Minister Fraser, what is being done to reduce passport delays for travelers? Um, so there's a number of different things, uh, and uh, at risk of uh, stepping on the toes of my, my colleague Karina Gould, who's been uh, leading this file, uh, the first thing that was done was the hiring of in excess of uh, 500 new staff, making sure that we have uh, the wickets open at Service Canada uh, and Passport Canada offices. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, I'm somebody who renewed passports for my own kids uh, a little while ago. There was no special lineup. Uh, and as a result of so many people who are applying all at once as the world opens back up, the demand is through the roof. Uh, a lot of it is for uh, first time applicants. A lot of it's for children who have uh, more complex applications. Uh, so what we're doing is essentially putting resources into the system. Uh, we're working with uh, Minister Gold's office to identify policy areas, simplified passport forms we can do to make a difference. I do anticipate that over time we're going to see both the demand come down and the ability to handle volumes continue to increase as it has been, and I think we're going to see a meaningful difference as we move forward to reduce the time people wait to get passports approved and issued. Th thank you. And the NDP says that uh, 2,900 immigration files uh, were lost. Where are they? 
Uh, so l let me just be clear, uh, there are no lost applications and I don't think it's responsible to be framing things that way. Uh, with respect, I'm actually very encouraged by the recent uptick in the pace of arrivals for Afghan refugees that have been ca coming to Canada. Uh, a few days ago we had a flight arrive that marked the 15,000th Afghan refugee who's landed in Canada. Another flight I believe uh, landed just yesterday bringing the total to about 15,300. Uh, what we're seeing right now is that there's people who are making their way through the process. Uh, as I shared during my uh, fairly recent appearance at the Afghan Committee, uh, we're uh, unlocking some additional spaces to process more people who are seeking to come to Canada. Uh, the reality at the end of the day is that we've seen uh, in excess of a million communications come into IRCC alone. There's a lot of people who have interest in coming to Canada. We're going to continue to use the special programs we've designed for humanitarian purposes, for the extended families of previously resettled interpreters, and importantly for those who served Canada during our time in Afghanistan. And we're not going to waver until we achieve our commitment of resettling at least 40,000 Afghan refugees in Canada. As for Ukrainian, uh, to get back to charter flights, um, so you mentioned the three that occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any plans for additional charter flights? So there have been some additional chartered flights that have landed already, some that were sponsored at a smaller to medium-sized scale by uh, private individuals or, or entities, uh, others including uh, provincial governments in my region, Atlantic Canada, uh, that have had very recent arrivals, including Newfoundland, which is now pursuing its second charter, uh, New Brunswick, which has just had one arrive, uh, Nova Scotia has been talking about it, Saskatchewan has been talking about it, so I expect there will be more. Uh, what we're seeing right now from a federal point of view is though it was helpful to arrange charters, uh, it's actually actually uh, more effective if we can push people towards uh, commercial opportunities, particularly through the Miles for Migrants initiative. One of the reasons is, and this is unique for a, um, I hesitate to call it a, a refugee system because uh, we've got a different legal characterization, but for all intents and purposes, these are people who are seeking refuge who are incredibly vulnerable. What we actually see is uh, this is different than other refugee crises where you have a centrally managed uh, effort by the UNHCR, for example, where people are processed and are staying in close physical proximity to one another after the crisis has, uh, has taken place and people have found a, a place to be processed and to wait for resettlement in another location. In this instance, after people have fled Ukraine, because they have the ability to travel through Europe, they've spread out to wherever they can find a safe place to rest their head. They may have personal connections, they may have employment opportunities, there's different reasons that motivate each person. Person. Charters don't work as well when you don't have everybody sitting in one particular city, like Warsaw for example, which is why most of our, uh, our charters have left from Poland. The Miles for Migrants opportunity actually allows people to travel from wherever in the world they have made it to for onward travel where they can find safety in Canada. It's also more efficient in some ways because you don't send an empty charter uh, over to pick people up and bring them back. You're dealing with a more effective means of transportation when you're dealing with a plane that was going there anyway to where a person already is and can still uh, take them cost free in the Miles for Migrants initiative to get to Canada for safety. Uh, so, is it, okay, last excluded? is it excluded to, to have more federal? Um, look, we, uh, I, I never would like to, to close the door because facts change on the grounds, but what we're seeing right now is that people are able to move. We don't have any other pending federal charters at this particular moment in time. I certainly want to watch closely to see uh, the, the real world data come in from the Miles for Migrants initiative uh, to see how effective that particular effort is. Uh, but as it stands now, we're seeing large numbers of people arriving in a very short period of time, and I think we can all agree that's a very good thing. Okay, thank okay, thanks so much. Bonjour. Oui. Donc, moi, j'avais quelques questions sur les Ukrainiens qui veulent gratuit à faire par des points européens. Donc, on a appris aujourd'hui que dans un premier temps, ce n'est une première ronde d'inscription qui commence demain et c'est seulement 500 billets qui sont en ligne disponibles. L'objectif, c'est 10 000 euh, vols gratuits. Euh, là, à ce rythme-là, vous pouvez que ça va assez vite. <rire> Écoutez, je pense que ça fait longtemps que vous m'entendez parler des vols nazis. Euh, la semaine qui a suivi euh, le début de la guerre, on a proposé les passerelles aériennes. Euh, donc là, on parle de ça fait plus de 100 jours qu'on a proposé ça. On, est, on nous est arrivé avec trois vols nolisés officiels en trois mois. Et là, le fameux programme qui devait être mis en place au mois de mai, finalement qui a été mis en place au mois de juin, qui nous garantissait 10 000 vols, c'est 500. Donc je pense que rendu à l'heure qui est rendue, là, le gouvernement a échoué. Il a échoué dans euh, sa volonté d'aider les Ukrainiens à fouler le sol du Canada. Et présentement, c'est extrêmement malheureux. Et ce n'est pas malheureux parce que la proposition du Bloc n'a pas été mise en place. C'est malheureux pour les Ukrainiennes et leurs enfants qui ne peuvent pas venir ici au Canada. Ils ont beau avoir vu leur demande traitée positivement pour l'autorisation de voyage, 
Mais si on traite une demande pour l'autorisation de voyage, qu'on était capable de les faire venir ici, ça aura donné quoi tout ça? Donc, c'est pas juste malheureux, c'est triste. Et il y a des gens présentement qui ne sont pas en sécurité. Et on pourrait les accueillir ici. Tout le monde est prêt pour les accueillir. Au lac Saint-Jean, je vous garantis qu'ils sont prêts pour les accueillir. Mais ils n'y arrivent pas. Le gouvernement a échoué. Merci. Every year, the Bank of Canada does its annual financial uh, report outlining what it views as the key systemic issues uh, with the Canadian economy. Obviously, uh, Conservatives are concerned uh, about, the, uh, about the higher costs now for borrowers. About uh, you know, two-thirds of Canadians own their own home, uh, and about half of those have a mortgage, and half of those have a variable mortgage. So we are seeing interest rates go up. We are seeing more money going out of households into paying for their mortgages. That's not great for the domestic economy. People are already stretched to the max because inflation is the number one concern. We've been proposing consistently in the House of Commons for the past four weeks, ideas, pragmatic solutions, getting rid of the GST on a temporary basis on gas, taking it off of household electricity bills, things that will put money in people's pocket today. And unfortunately, the government has given a 10 year to those things. So we're going to continue to push those, those issues because we know Canadians need the help. Uh, Are Conservatives concerned at all that the neutral rate that the governor was talking about, around 3%, that it could potentially go higher and what the economic consequences of that might be, particularly for the housing situation? Oh, absolutely. Again, as I've said a few times in the press, inflation can eat out an economy. Uh, it can eat up an economy very quickly. And so essentially between Justin Trudeau's excessive spending uh, coupled with uh, the, the, uh, the higher uh, than normal or lower than normal interest rates to deal with that, the bank, between the bank and the government, there is a tremendous amount of, uh, of, uh, of fiscal stimulus that is overheating. I am concerned, as are uh, my conservative colleagues, uh, about interest rates. I'll leave it to the bank uh, to, to be able to decide what level that they need to be at. Um, but again, we are worried about interest rates taken away uh, from, uh, from Canadian households at a time where they have very little to pay for uh, the hike in groceries and on gas. Uh, Stephen Tapp from the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has pointed out that until the bank raises interest rates to a high enough rate, essentially uh, it's stimulating the Canadian economy, uh, and that's not helpful for inflation. But a lot of these variables are also global. There are global factors as well that's driving problems in the economy right now. You have supply chain issues. I mean, what can the federal government do to sort of combat some of those things? Well, it's conservative. Sure. Well, Trevor Tome is a University of Calgary economist, and he has said that the actions uh, that the UCP government has taken in Alberta uh, to actually reduce gas prices in April actually reduced their inflation rate in, in, in Alberta. So check his Twitter feed. It's right there. This is one of the reasons why we're suggesting at a time where uh, the, the government is getting windfall revenues. Look, they have so much money coming in between inflation and between higher gas prices and other commodities, uh, but they're not devoting it to helping Canadians to cope with the pressures of today. So look, it's good for consumers to lower the, pi the price of the pumps. It's also better for the economy because it reduces inflation. Remember, inflation, uh, you know, when you, when you put more, when, it, when gasoline costs goes up, grocery costs go up. The price of almost everything goes up. So we think that the, the government can do a lot more for Canadians today just by giving them some tax relief on a temporary basis. Question about the economy for two seconds. I mean, you're, you're, your part of the lower mainland is maybe a little cheaper, but still pretty pretty tough place to... to are you talking so, about housing? I'm talking about housing and I'm talking about the economy. We're sort of following on the governor of Bank Canada today. Gasoline so. is two dollars and thirty-six cents a liter. Yeah. Highest in North America. And uh, we are ground zero of Canada's housing affordability crisis. So, no, it's not easier in the Lower Mainland. I agree. So, do you, how, how, aside, you know, it's, it's, there are many parts of this puzzle, but what, what do you think uh, the feds can do to? Well, the feds can certainly, uh, do whatever they can with their infrastructure dollars to encourage more house construction. And uh, a constituent in my riding, a builder put forward a very, what I thought was a sensible proposal and uh, Minister Hassan has just ignored it, unfortunately. I can give you more detail. It was actually in the Global Mail 
on okay. Friday. That's okay. for we'll, you. We'll so. look that up. I'm just, what I'm trying to get here is I, I'm trying to, uh, you know, I'm obviously Dan Elvis is the finance critic. Of course. I mean, you, well, he's BC too, but a different part. So I'm just thinking because of where you live and because it's a growing people trying to have families, <laughs> yes. you know. That's where I'm coming. Yeah, it certainly is. People have moved up, families have moved up from Vancouver, traditionally, to Langley, and have sort of, because housing is cheaper, but not really anymore. You know, like, the average house price is now well over a million dollars, $800,000 for a starter town home. It really has become unaffordable and almost impossible for first-time buyers to get into a house. It's very sad. Thank you for stopping. Good to see Good. you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I mean, how are things for you down in Windsor? Like, it's a challenge. Um, we have the border still as an issue, um, even though there is some more progress with regards to people who be able to come back and forth, uh, but it hasn't recovered fully. Um, so the tourism is one thing, but it's also about the relationships of people getting back and forth, and it creates other business opportunities. So without having that return to normal, and I've been asking this government for a safe border task force, um, there has been still continued problems. I'll flag one issue that hasn't got a lot of attention, which is really going to be critical, is Nexus. Uh, there are in thousands and thousands of people without their proper nexus documents uh, and there's a backup for it and that's why I wanted a safe border task force. We work on things in progress um, but they've ignored it and so now you have the passport issue where there's all kinds of chaos there. Nexus is right on the next thing and that's going to affect the economy. Where I'm also going with it is cost of living. Is there something, uh, the federal system is, is a little different in what it can do versus Queen's Park but is there something that Ottawa can do that can help try to reduce the, the inflation, the cost of living sure. issues that are affecting people in, in Greater Windsor? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like everybody else, we're affected by high gas prices. And one of the things we've been calling for is a petroleum monitoring system and also an ombudsman office. Um, we don't have the same information for rack pricing that the United States enjoys, so there's more accountability for price increases. And what we need over here is a structure in place to make sure that we're not getting ripped off. So that's one of the things we can do is more consumer protection during this process. And same with the grocery stores, we've seen that as well too, more accountability. Our consumer laws are terrible in this country. We're abysmal on protecting consumers. We've even had breast price fixing in the past. Uh, those are the things that Ottawa should be looking at, uh, even outside of uh, the, the issue right now, because we're getting ripped off many times. Is there anything in particular that you see uh, affecting when you're talking about people being ripped off when you go to fill up your, uh, I'm sure, domestically yep. made car? Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, more, more accountability for pricing and more transparency and also consumer protection and to crack down on um, when there's improper activity from different companies. We can go back even historically, look at Volkswagen and um, the, the scandal that they went through. Uh, American consumers were treated much better than Canadians. Uh, same with when it came to um, other types of auto recalls. So there's, there's just a host of things. We're basically uh, like treated like a colony when it comes to consumer rights. And that's a real problem because then what you have is that you have things baked into the price that we pay all the time that we shouldn't have to. Like what, just for precision, what's, what's baked into the price? So. Oh, well this company is either not lack of competition or um, increased profits and then not getting um, the proper consumer compensation. Uh, for it's a, a good one is auto recall where in the United States where they've been getting vehicles or compensation, uh, even investment in different things, whereas Canadians have to foot the bill for those things during those types of things. So we don't get the back end of the consumer protection uh, with regards to it. So it adds up, you get nickel and dimed at the end of the day. What is the benchmark that this government needs to show that it's, that it's serious about action on climate change? The benchmark always has been and remains to this day to follow the science on the climate crisis. That means no more than a 1.5 degree rise in global average temperatures, ensuring we do our fair share, which is a 60% reduction by 2030. And there's any number of different ways to get there, of course, but ending subsidies to fossil fuels and taking the funding they're currently putting into tax credits on car carbon capture, for example, 7.1 billion between now and 2030, investing that in a prosperous transition for workers, those are the kinds of actions that would help to get us there. And electric vehicles, is that a good way to... Electric a vehicles certainly can be part of the solution transportation, particularly in Ontario, is our largest emission source. But it can't be the only thing. We, we need to be looking at high-speed rail, for example, and active transportation, and not uh, looking away from the need to end the subsidies to fossil fuels and to in, invest that. The number one budget item in our so-called so emissions reduction plan 
is focused on a false climate solution. So is the government serious right now in your opinion about fighting climate change? Or? Well, answering that question, serious about climate, means following the science, and we're not doing, doing that. 48 hours to cancel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that.